initially clicked on another link to get in and Rick is in that room too. And I thought this doesn't look right. So I went back again and then I found this one. So you might want to try and track down Rick. I don't know. Okay. I think I can do that for sure. Um, okay. Um, good afternoon and welcome folks. I'm going to ask Alejandro to do our language justice piece. Awesome. Thank you all so much for having me back one more time. My name is Alejandro. I'll be the Spanish English interpreter, and I'm going to provide instructions in Spanish first, then come back and repeat them in English in just a moment. Eh, hola a todos. Gracias por tenerme aquí con ustedes una vez más. Mi nombre es Alejandro Arrieta, seré el intérprete del, del español y, y del inglés. Y en este espacio, como siempre, queremos practicar la justicia del lenguaje lo más posible para que cada persona pueda participar en el idioma de su corazón o en el idioma de su preferencia. Este, con eso, eh, después de que repita estas instrucciones en inglés, van a ver un icono terráqueo como un mundo que va a aparecer en la parte de abajo a mano derecha en su pantalla. Cuando aparezca ese icono terráqueo, asegúrese de seleccionarlo y escoger el español como su idioma preferido. Y si usted encuentra que es necesario poner el audio original en silencio, lo puede hacer justo abajo en el mismo sitio. Voy a repetir esto en inglés y de ahí les regreso su tiempo para comenzar. All right. Uh, so once again, thanks for having me. And of course, in this space, we do want to practice language justice as much as possible, like always. So with that in mind, if you are not fluently bilingual in both English and Spanish, after these instructions, not quite yet, but afterwards, you're going to see a globe icon, like a little world, appear on the bottom right-hand side of your screen. Once that pops up, make sure you click on it and select English as your preferred language. And if you find it necessary during the meeting, you can always go right back into that same setting and hit mute original audio. Um, but with that, I will pass it back over to Jordan to turn on the interpretation. Ya vamos a aprender la interpretación. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to start it. And let Rick in. Okay, and we'll do, does everybody hear me okay in English? Thumbs up. And then if you're using the Spanish. Awesome. Thank you. Okay, and I'm going to go ahead and record for this meeting. We've got some folks who wanted to be here and couldn't be. And so um, they are, we, so we are recording today so they can get the details on some of these pieces of legislation. Um, welcome. My name is Jordan Garcia. I use he and his pronouns, and I'm at the American Friends Service Committee. And Alejandro is our interpreter for today. Um, so maybe I'll do a little bit more of this, just, just um, bear with me, is that if you're go if you're speaking a little too fast, he will come off of, um, he'll come on camera and maybe go like this, say so just slow down a little bit, <laughs> um, just in case. And um, yeah, we're really happy to have you all here today. Um, this spotlight on the state legislature is focused solely on housing related, um, legislation. In the past, we've done, uh, we've tried to do like every bit of legislation at the state capitol that um, pertains to immigration or or immigrant rights. And this year, we decided to try and do housing first uh, and go deep on that a little bit more. And then next month, we might, I think we're going to do health care. And then after that, we might do some other pieces of legislation um, that are of interest to this community. Um, additionally, I wanted to let folks know that um, uh, Elizabeth and an another uh, woman named Aya have been working on a bill tracker, um, and it is um, a way that we kind of try to keep track of the different bills that are um, of interest to our communities and um, find out, you know, where they are in the state legislature, who the sponsors are, what kind of testimony is needed, that sort of thing. Um, so today we have Elizabeth and Misha um, here to help us um, really go deep on some of these pieces of legislation. And um, if it's okay with you, Misha, I was going to let Elizabeth go first. Um, she's got a couple of, of ones um, and then we can do a little Q&A also. And just letting a, a few more people in the room. 
We'll wait till they get set uh, with their audio and everything. And I think everyone else that I know so far knows how to you do the interpretation. So, oh, we still got some people rolling in. So um, for interpretation, uh, you'll see the, the globe icon at the bottom of your screen and you can select your um, language of preference. Great. Okay. We'll just get, let, we'll let Donna get in the room too. And then sometimes Zoom makes people hang out in the waiting room for a little bit longer than I'd like. Okay, so I'd like to, I'm proud and excited to in, introduce introduce Elizabeth Wamukoya um, with the Colorado People's Alliance, and she is the um, organizing co-director, is that right? And she's going to share a little bit about a couple pieces of legislation that um, Colorado People's Alliance is, is looking at. Thank you, Jordan. Um, thank you for the inv invitation. Um, happy to be with with y'all this evening um, and highlighting some of the the housing bills. Um, I One of the ones that I, I know Jordan alluded to some like immer, the immigrant community and spotlighting different ones. Um, and uh, this one has a big impact on our community. A lot of the impacted in black and brown communities where there's one that deals with um, land use and occupancy limits. I will put in the chat for those who are able um, to view as it has been introduced um, in case you want to read some of the bill language, see who um, is sponsoring, but it's with Rep. Marbury and Rutenell and Senators Exum and Gonzalez. And so essentially what this bill works on is to prohibit um, local government for um, enacting or for enforcing uh, residential occupancy limits unless that it's tied to like a minimum square footage or like a requirement that deals with safety, health, um, and welfare. So it has to have those those backings. Otherwise there's not going to be um occupancy limits with, with that. I mean, you know, with a lot of black and brown communities, that's a big thing of of multi-generational and different things of that nature. Thank you, Jordan, for bringing that in. Um, that it impacts when when those regulations are in place and we know that Colorado is not a cheap place to live in. Um, and making sure that there is adequate reasoning behind what some of the parameters are um that are placed. And then um I also wanted to speak to Oops, I accidentally closed the tab instead of copying it. Um, but I wanted to speak to a couple um, additional, one that's not, I don't believe is int int introduced yet, and one that just recently got introduced that deals with um, housing. And I'll also drop this one in the chat of the first one dealing with insurance coverage and transparency when it comes to homeowners and um, construction defects. And so um, this really boils down to a lot of inconsistencies with accountability to shoddy construction or things that have um, come up where in Colorado, it is not a requirement for them to carry certain liability um, insurances, um, nor disclose that to homeowners. And so that came up in committee um, just this past week. Um, and I'm sure they're gonna have additional opportunities for testifying in that space. I know they had made a request on the 25th for that, um, but I'm sure there's gonna be more. Um, Alinsta and Marbury are a part of that space, but the thing that we are not in support of that they want to do um, are those two Dems want to make it where the homeowners aren't um, able to know what the cost of that is because it says that it automatically lets them you know, advocate for themselves and knowing how much to sue for if something were to go awry and hold accountable. And obviously we don't want that removed from from the bill. Um, and so that there's accountability in requiring that type of insurance. And also when there's been studies to compare to other states, um, Colorado is, is very much lacking in that regard. And similarly, there's a second bill that Zenzinger is going to be um, sponsoring that deals with um, a tangent from what is uh, shoddy work or defects or just construction um, issues where a lot of times um, homeowners are required to just accept whatever the the 
the fix they say is for the home and it, a lot of times it's not sufficient or they don't do as great of a job and they might say that it's just a window that needs to be fixed but actually there's a deeper foundational um, issue as an example and so it removes a lot of a lot of the issues where a lot of times people run into trouble of accountability because um, the main contractor would say that, oh, I subcontract that I'm not liable to do it. Or if they offer to fix the issue, it still doesn't fix. It actually causes more problems where there's accountability, where you're able to actually go after the main contractor who did do that, um, where subcontractors might be employed for something and it gets closed down. Um, and also homeowners have the right to accept or reject if they bring an offer for how to fix um, fix whatever is the issue, as well as extend the statutes of limitation card. It has one of the shortest ones of two years. Um, and I, the one I think one of the parameters is to extend that and what is the statute of limitation because certain things take time to actually present themselves as construction defects and are quite pricey, especially if you cannot hold um, contractors and particularly subcontractors accountable um, and making sure that there's more um, ease in advocating for yourself and those rights right now I think it they there has to be a 50 percent plus one majority if there's like a association and voting on that proceeding and um a lot of uh companies are wanting to move to make it two-thirds will make it even harder for them to be held accountable and we definitely don't want that we would want it lessened um and where homeowners have I mean you put that much investment into a home you have the ability to accept or reject their their fixing and find someone that's comparable and get that um that payment process and so that one is not yet introduced um for the second portion of that but the first half was and uh, since we have uh, someone here for the four cause evictions, I'll just say that we're championing, we're supporting uh, full on for that, but I won't talk about it because she she gets to share on on the the awesomeness of that bill. Um, but those are the the spaces in COPA that we are supporting as relates to housing. Questions. Yeah, I was just going to invite folks if they have questions about these um these bills. Um I do I do have one question which is that um do you are you in need of testimony on on either of these bills or do you know if either of these bills need testimony? I'm pretty sure um well, yes. Um the one for occupancy limits I'm sure is going to need some but definitely for the last two that I said of you know homeowners who either have gone through um similar issues of where there is an accountability or they move into a home and find out those defects over time um those two I know that they they do need um they do need do you want to translate was, oh, was I sorry? That was you, Jordan, putting it. I was just like, yeah. oh, someone asked a question. Can you translate after I'm done? Just kidding. Um, but the the one of accepting or rejecting, as well as of the insurance, they're definitely going to um ask for testimony again. I know that they did ask for the January twenty fifth one. Um, but they they were like, oh, if you can keep a, a list of anybody in our membership that that can speak to that or an experience they face with that too, especially the component where they want to remove or homeowners get to know how much it is. Um, that's an important part to kind of deter um, uh, Leprinson and Marbury from having that amended and taken out. Like that would be a great, uh, if, if there's anyone who can speak particular to that of why certain transparencies are necessary and should be a part of what um, a homeowner is entitled to. Gotcha. Thank you. And if folks did want to testify on on one of those bills, would they reach out to you or? Um, they can. Well, yes, they can reach out to me. Um, it kind of depends on which which bill and where we're at. We're supporting it, but we're not the ones that are leading on full 
like we're we're not the main leads for the organizer component, but if you do reach out to me, I'll either um send information for when it is where we're participating in the testimony. And if not, I'll always forward you to the person who will be. So happy to help. I feel like it's it might be easier since you saw me in this space to just connect with me in this space instead of someone else. Awesome. Mm-hmm. Just gonna put that in the chat and I'll um do you want to put your email address in the chat? Yes. Typing it now. Awesome. Does anyone else have any other questions for Elizabeth about one of these bills? Okay. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Elizabeth. I know that um you had something you needed to get to, but we really appreciate you coming and talking to us about, about these bills. Um, they are, um, they, sound, yeah, they sound important, especially for homeowners. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm really excited for the, the four cause as well. And the occupancy limits one, those ones are, are very big for those of us that are, are renters. Um, and I will say that the, when we first were, um, working on some of the homeowner ones, we wanted to see bills come that helped renters, especially where there's issues with getting maintenance covered adequately. I'm not sure I'm not sure whether that's going to make it on this year's or next year's, but that's something to consider because there's a lot that has happened in our community. I mean, we've seen an Aurora where new builds caught on fire or had explosions and no one was really held accountable and people were displaced and um home ownership is so important, but there's a lot that's going on with disparities with renters and housing is a new space that Hope is stepping into as members have brought that as a space of intersection to our traditional three of immigrant climate and economic justice. But we we definitely um need to to have a, a little more space and presence for renters' rights as well. Um, which is like I said, the the four cause evictions. I'm very excited um for Misha to speak on, but even for where there are other spaces similar to homeowners where when maintenance doesn't come in for two months and you don't have, uh, you know, working heat in the middle of, you know, a freeze like what we've had. I, I went through that personally recently where my heat went out and they said we can come in two days. And I'm like, my house is at 40 degrees. <laughs> um, and and what that looks like of accountability and where we can um, advocate and take action when certain things are not are not met. Um, and so that was just an off topic, but on topic plug as a consideration even for this group um in the event some of these bills that have similar for renters do make it in this legislative session but if not something for next year to kind of keep an eye out as well thank you everyone awesome, awesome. thank you so much hopefully you can stay for some of misha's um, yes I am. <laughs> great yeah i don't have to leave until it was 6 15 so oh. i'm here until then oh yeah. great um Awesome. Well, um, Misha, I, I hate to say that I think of you as kind of the main event for this spotlight on, but I do. <laughs> um, I do have, after Misha shares a little bit about for cause eviction, I have um, a bill I can share with you all about um, safe, that's called Safe Housing for Residential Tenants with Julie, Julie Gonzalez is putting forward and another one on mobile homes. But our members have expressed, um, similar to, to Liz's members, have expressed just a lot of, of um, interest and hunger for housing justice and the intersection with our um, uh, immigrant justice work. So um, thank you so much. Misha is the Colorado Homes for All um, Coalition Manager. Is that right, Misha? Cool. And um, is um, uh, uh, in a strange twist of fate was able to join us today. So thank you for being here, Misha. Take it away. <laughs> Yes, I am so glad to be here, Elizabeth. It was wonderful to hear your updates as well. There are, um, I think, a lot of opportunities this session, um, and it, it it has been a strange twist of fate because I um, thought that I was going to be um, at the Capitol all, to, all day today, but that was not the case, and I'm really um, grateful that I get to join you all. So I'm going to share my screen. I wasn't able to put everything in my slides that I wanted to in time, but I um, wanted to prepare something. Jordan, are you... Um, willing to make me a co-host so I can share my screen? Yes. Here we go. Perfect. Let's see. 
All right. Can you all see my my screen now? Yes. Okay. Perfect. So as Jordan said, um, I am the coalition manager for Colorado Homes for All. We are focused on passing for cause eviction this year. Um, if you were engaged in the legislative session last year, you probably heard um, of just cause eviction, just a minor name change. Um, the bill is very similar. It is HB 241098. Um, and let's see if I can be as good as Elizabeth and actually drop a link in here for you all. Um, I think I can. So if you do want to see the bill language directly, I just dropped the link in the chat as well. Um, I use she, her, a, a pronouns, and I'm really excited to share um, where for cause eviction is, what it will cover and answer questions, as well as share opportunities for engagement. Um, you know, I think this bill is, is particularly important from a housing justice perspective um, for many immigrants as well as refugees. You know, in Colorado, we know that something like 10,000 to 53,000 people are experiencing homelessness. Um, and, and a big reason for that is because of, of eviction. Um, and I'm sure many of us know how hard it is to find a place. And once you find a place, um, there is also staying in that place. And so for cause eviction is really focused on um, the staying in, in place side of it, right? Being able to choose to stay in your community if, um, if you want to. So these are our um, sponsors for the bill. So these are very similar from last year. We only have one change. Um, so Senators Gonzalez and Senator Henrichson, um, and then Representative Mabry and Majority Leader Duran. Previously last year, it was um, Representative Gonzalez Gutierrez, who is now on the Denver City Council. And we are really excited to have Majority Leader Duran um, joining us this year. She is really, um, really spearheading a lot of this work along with our other sponsors. Okay, so as I talked about, really, this is focused on keeping people in their homes, right? And so, you know, you'll see, you know, on social media, we talk about keep Colorado's housed a lot of the hashtag that we're using. Um, but really, what the bill does is it limits the reasons that a landlord can end a tenancy, right? So at this point in time, um, landlords nationally have a lot of power. And that is true in Colorado as well. And in Colorado, a landlord can basically end a tenancy for any reason, no reason. Um, we know a lot of times that the reason that a landlord is um, ending a tenancy might be because of discrimination. We hear about racial discrimination. We hear about um, discrimination or retaliation connected to um, asking your landlord for, for things that you need. Um, and so really this bill is looking at ways that we can limit um, landlords ending a tenancy. So I'm going to talk about the two different sort of categories um, that are covered in this bill. So there are what are called four cause evictions and no fault evictions. And I'm going to check the chat because I know that I speak really fast sometimes and I want to make sure that the interpreters aren't saying slow down. Yeah, okay. you're good so far. <laughs> Perfect. Thanks, Jordan. Um, so we're going to talk about four cause eviction reasons first. So this is um, reasons that a landlord can evict. Um, really any time during a lease, during a month-to-month -month lease, really at any time. Um, so those reasons would be things like non-payment of rent, violating lease terms, damaging or destroying the property, or criminal activity in unit, right? These are not new reasons that a landlord can evict. These are reasons that landlords um, evict currently. Um, and so these reasons are, are considered for cause eviction reasons. Now, I think the really exciting about part of this bill is the no fault eviction reasons, right? So limiting the reasons that a landlord um, can evict outside of those, those four, um, four cause reasons. So right now, you know, if you think about um, the end of a lease, um, or you think about um, like on a month to month lease, right? Like a landlord basically can say for whatever reason, bye, we don't, you know, we don't want you here. Um, and so this would really limit those reasons and it would limit it to four reasons. So maybe a landlord um, wants their family member to move in, or maybe they want to move into the unit themselves. That would be a, a no fault reason. Maybe they are demolishing or converting um, the unit. That, that would be a reason. Um, if the landlord is planning on taking it off of the rental market altogether and they're planning on selling the property, that would be a reason. Um, and then limited 
um, time limited housing. So that's that's housing that was set up to be temporary in nature to begin with. So things like hotels or other kinds of short term housing. And so these would be essentially the four reasons that um, th there could be a no fault eviction um, or a, a reason to end a tenancy. And so with these, though, there's a number of notices. So for the majority of these, um, or I should say for, let me be a little bit more specific, for um, a landlord moving in for demolition or conversion of a property, and I'm, I realized I was going to miss one, um, and it's in the Spanish and it's not in the English, which is substantial renovations and repairs. Um, so I did a good job of getting the Spanish in there and forgot to translate it back into English. Um, so for family member for demolition for um, substantial renovations, there would be a 90 day notice period. That's significant, right? Like we're talking about a landlord having to provide three months of notice. Um, the other for, for like a, the landlord selling the property, they would need to provide 120 days of notice. That's four months. Um, and with, you know, if a landlord wants to sell, um, they would have to agree to essentially keep the property, um, unlisted for rent for, for 90 days. The idea being, right, like you actually have to be making a good faith effort to sell it. It can't just be a loophole for you to say you're going to sell it and then, you know, you do nothing and then you you re-rent it. Um, so that's a little bit about the, the reasons for no fault eviction. Now, I also want to share when for cause when this bill doesn't apply. So there are a few scenarios where um, this law doesn't protect tenants. Um, it's it's pretty limited, the reasons, but um, it's worth calling out um, the, the specific scenarios. So one, short-term rental properties are not covered by these protections. Um, if a landlord lives in the home, so that would be in a couple of different scenarios. That's if it's like a single family home with or without an accessory dwelling unit. Some folks call those casitas, some call them mother-in-law units, um, if it's a duplex or a triplex. But in all of these cases, the landlord needs to live on the property. Um, and then mobile home owners. Now, the reason that mobile home owners are, are excluded is because they actually have better protections or, or more tailored protections through some mobile home park legislation um, in the past. But mobile home, I still haven't figured out quite how to say this, renters of mobile homes would still be protected, right? So folks that are renting, that own their mobile home, but are renting their lot, mobile home owners not covered, but if they are renting both the mobile home and the lot underneath, they are covered. I think that so, applies to some of our members. For some of you, you have you have renters that are in mobile homes. I believe so. Yeah. So that's, that's great. That's great that's to know. No, thank you. Yeah. So I think a lot of folks, when when they see all of this, they're like, okay, but like, what happens if the landlord is a bad landlord and breaks the law? Right. Like we hear all kinds of, of horror stories about about landlords. Um, that really don't care about tenant rights, that really um, want to take advantage and, and really, um, I think it's, it's a valid question, what happens if they break this law? So there's a couple of things. There is what is written in this bill and there is what is already in law. So both things would happen, right? So in the bill, um, we have relocation assistance. So this is a penalty specifically. So if they don't follow um, in particular the notice provisions around a no fault eviction, they would need to um, provide the tenant two months rent. And if there are residents in the home that are under the age of 18, are low income or working class folks, are individuals with disabilities, then they need to provide an additional one month. So two months in general, three months if, um, if there are residents that fall into e any of these categories. That's what, what the bill does. In law, what already exists is um, that the landlord is responsible for attorney fees from the tenant to fight this, damages, three times the monthly rent or $5,000, and that is whichever is higher, um, and the right to either stay in the home or be able to go back to the home. <coughs> Excuse me, got a little tickle in my throat. Okay, so this is last week. I'm pretty amped about it. Um, so I just want to talk a little bit about um, our pathway here. So um, 
some of you may be familiar with sort of how a bill becomes a law in case you are not. Um, I think it's really helpful information to know that is not often shared. And so um, our pathway really is we need to go through a House committee. We need to go to the House floor and have it voted on. And I'm sorry, I've got this little tickle on my throat. I think you can see Rebecca in there <coughs> in this picture. Yeah, where? From other folks. Yeah. I, okay. That's okay. <laughs> I love it. It's a lot of folks. We had about 100 people come to our press conference last um, last week. And so it was a really amazing moment. And it, it is hard to point people out, um, which is a problem I like to have. So really our pathway, though, we'll have our House committee. We'll have um, a House floor vote. Then we'll go to the Senate. We will have one Senate committee and we will go to the Senate floor. Um, what that means is that we have a lot of work to do to make sure that legislators vote yes on this bill. Um, and as you can see, we are our building power. So this was our press conference last week. Um, our sponsors, a couple of our sponsors were, were speaking. Um, there was a tenant that spoke, a small landlord. Um, spoke a really it was really um, an inspiring event um, and then you can see we had a lot of folks that, that turned out just to show legislators and show the media how important this bill is so I'm going to talk next about opportunities to get involved but I want to pause because I just shared a ton of information um, are there questions about the bill itself Okay. I have Don't a question worry. on uh, the uh, uh, criminal activity piece. Does that also apply to uh, activity that occurs in the neighborhood as well as actually in the unit, or is that separate? In other Watch words, that. if if somebody is if somebody is uh, um, attacking the neighbors or uh, doing something like that is that um, is that part of this you mean like if a tenant that lives there is attacking neighbors yes that's a very that's a very specific question um I don't know let me let me follow up um, over email with you on on that piece um, this falls under a part of the law called um, like a substantial violation, which I think in general talks about criminal activity. I don't know if it speaks specifically at the property level, which is to your point, right? If it's happening on the property by a tenant, even if it's not in their unit or if it's talking about unit specific. So I'll have to follow up with you on that one, Tom. It's a good question. Right, thank you. What other questions do folks have? And I'll check the chat to see if I'm missing anything. Um, looks like Laura has a question about timeline, but you might be coming there next. Yeah. Um, in terms of timeline, we're not scheduled for committee just yet. Um, so as soon as um, we have a, a firm date for committee, I can certainly share that information out. Elizabeth, I don't know if you want to speak to your comment in the chat. Um, yeah, uh, what Tom asked is something that I've I've heard before of um if a tenant, if something happens of the difference between a crime that happened or something that takes place within a unit or an individual themselves, and it might be near the unit or external outside of that um community and the management is made aware of that, where where those stipulations lie and the interpretation of that has has varied. Um, and I just say that because I, I know in a neighborhood where um, that has been the case of, of issues or stuff that put harm of 
other tenants present, but it wasn't that they committed a crime within the unit or even on the property, but it was someone that was still causing undue hardships because of stuff they did externally within the community with that and what those parameters are. So that's not the first time I've heard a similar question. That's why I was just echoing it, if that gave added context to you. That's really that's really helpful. I'll follow up um with Jordan, who hopefully Jordan, you can email it out maybe to to this crew um about what I hear on it. I also will say um my some of our experience with leases is that leases often have a lot included in them, and often one of the things that you see in leases is about like um you know using amenities correctly, you know treating the property with care, that kind of thing. And so one of the um, four cause reasons is lease violations. Um, and so in maybe not in all cases, but in many cases, I think something like that probably would be covered. But like I said, let me let me get a more definitive answer before um, before I say anything further. Okay. Don't worry, we can we can talk more questions afterwards too. Um, okay, so let's see if my slideshow will let me go forward. Here we go. Oh, that was backwards. It didn't help us, did it? Okay, so here are opportunities to get involved. Um, so there are a few different ways um, to get involved. So, you know, if you are a tenant or you're working with, with tenants um, who have a, a story to share about the impact of an end of, of tenancy, um, particularly if it involves a landlord that gave no reason or if they gave a no fault reason. So that would be like, you know, the landlord says, oh, I'm going to move back in or I am going to sell the unit or I've got to make substantial repairs. Um, if, if folks have those types of stories um, and are willing and if you're willing to share those stories about why for cause would be really a valuable um a valuable law and protection for you. We'd love to have you come testify in committee. We really need to show strong support in committee and are definitely looking for more folks that can come and share. Um, and you know, I'll, I'll say in case there are others, if there are small landlords um, as well in this meeting, you know, definitely we can use the perspective of, of small landlords as well, talking about how these are, you know, really important protections. Um, because you know, we do sometimes hear, oh well, you know, landlords don't support this, but we know that there are. Um, there are many small landlords that support this legislation. Um, meeting with legislators. So another way, um, if testimony is not the right avenue for you, uh, meeting with legislators is a really impactful way, you know, sharing with them why this legislation is important to you, attending one of their town halls, um, or, you know, if they don't have a town hall coming up, reaching out to them and saying, hey, can I set up a meeting with you? Um, writing a letter to the editor. So if you are someone that enjoys writing, you know, sharing why um, with your local publication or local newspaper, why um, for cause is so important is a really helpful way to show up. And then also emailing your legislator, um, you know, and sharing with them why. So these are really, uh, I think the core ways to, that, that we're um, trying to show legislators the support that we have for this bill. Um, I have, I've shared with Jordan a number of resources around testimony and meeting with legislators. And there, we've got a um, LTE um, as well as an email toolkit. So if you're trying to think about like how to frame, Jordan has access to those resources and, and um, can share them as, um, as helpful for folks. And really, you know, if you have um, a story that you'd like to share for testimony, it'd be wonderful um, if you are, are able to reach out to Jordan and um, we can get in touch about um, getting you on, on the testimony list. What questions do folks have? I have a question that's a little bit about um, kind of the strategy. Um, well, I mean, well, actually, my first question is, how has the bill changed from last year? Um, is it just semantics? Is it is there are there any other um, changes? Yeah, there have definitely been a few changes, and I actually um, I have a list of the changes. So give me one second just to pull that up. And um, I'll just say while you're looking at that, I'm looking for that that um letters to the end. I'll just say I'll 
do a plug. Um, letters to the editor are a great way to kind of um, influence <laughs> things. Um, it supposedly it is the um, second most read page of the newspaper by policymakers. So um, a lot of policymakers will read the front page and then read the letters to the editor page. I don't know if that has changed over time, but that is a, a fact we used to share with people um, when we were inviting them to get involved with letter writing. So I didn't know that. Like I, I knew that letters to the editor were impactful, but I had no idea the extent that that people were um, or that legislators were tuning in. I'm glad to to hear that. Yeah, a lot of policymakers will use them as kind of like a community temperature check. <laughs> Lori, I see your question in the chat. Um, that's that's exactly right, right? Like evictions and end of tenancies can only happen if they have a for cause or a no fault reason. And I see Rebecca, um, I, are you asking for Jordan to repeat his tip? Oh, all I was sharing is that policymakers, um, we have heard that policymakers read the letters to the editor page of the newspaper um, frequently to get uh, a sense of what the, what the community thinks about what's what's going on. So letters to the editor are a great way to influence policymakers. Oh, tip on the letter, uh, any newspaper? Good question. Um, Misha, I assume we're targeting the Denver Post, but are there legislators in other parts of the state that we need to influence? Yeah, so that is a really, that's a really great question. Um, so I think Yes, you should definitely target the newspapers that you read, um, that you think that your community reads. I think that's really helpful. Um, other um, publications that we're looking at are definitely the Denver Post, um, Aurora Sentinel, the Boulder Daily Camera, Colorado Community Media, Colorado Politics, um, Longmont Times, the Denver Gazette, Colorado Springs Gazette. Um, those are sort of the, the big ones to, to focus on. And I want to come back to your question, Jordan, because I didn't forget about it. And I did find um, I did find my notes on this. So in terms of differences from last year, um, the name is the most obvious one um, for cause instead of just cause. Um, there are some changes around applicability. So, um, you know, applicability being that um, primary residents for landlords, including single family, duplex and triplex are exempt. Um, as well as short-term rentals. That is a little bit different than where the bill landed last year. Um, this year's bill includes time-limited housing and selling of the property as no-fault um, reasons for, for eviction. Last year's bill um, had relocation assistance in, in a different format. Now it is only as a penalty. So before relocation assistance was um, a broader, a broader piece of the bill. And now it is really specifically if the landlord fails to follow the law. Um, and then I think one of the things that was removed from the bill is last year there was a there was language essentially saying that leases needed to be substantially um, identical when a new lease was offered. That piece has has been removed. Um, and then we have also added language to prevent retaliatory rent increases. So while it doesn't prevent rent increases, is that would um, that would go against our statewide ban on rent stabilization. It does say that retaliatory rent increases are um, are not allowed. Gotcha. Thank you, Piper. Did you want to ask a question? Solo quería uh, agregar que una cosa que me nos ha llamado la atención es el periódico El Comercio, porque es en inglés y es también en español. Y varios de nuestros miembros en el pasado han hecho un, un artículo eh, como carta al editor, pero te dan como todo una sección y lo publican en los dos idiomas y así abercas más de la comunidad. A veces otros medios de comunicación se han interesado después. Entonces, si alguien que habla español está interesado en escribo, escribir los subpuntos en español, ese es un buen periódico, podemos respaldarla en hacerlo.
Thank you, Jennifer. I wrote um, I wrote that down. I'm excited to um, see this newspaper, and I'm really excited that they are offering their content bilingually. Thank you. I went ahead and put a link to that newspaper in the chat. It's in my it's in my neighborhood uh, grocery store for sure. Do people have other questions for Amisha? I have one more, but I want to let other people. Um, can you just tell us a little bit about the strategy and and um, if there's if there's opposition to the bill, if there's particular committees that look hard, if there's um, um sticky moments in the in your expectations of. Uh, how things will go that we can try and pitch in at the, at those points. Yeah, um, I'd be happy to share that if if we can end the recording at this point because it's a little bit more sensitive in nature. Sure. All right. Um, we have, I just have one or two more bills that I wanted to share with you all. Um, one of them is called the, Mo oh, no, not that one. Uh, Senator Julie Gonzalez is putting forward a bill that's called the Safe Housing for Residential Tenants Bill. It's concerning safe housing for residential tenants and in connection therewithin, establishing and clarifying procedures regarding a tenant's claim of breach of warranty of hab habitability. So um, what this means <laughs> is that it establishes a time frame for when the landlord must communicate with a tenant and remediate some kind of action um, and related to the habitability, the livability of a, of a premise, of a residential premise. Um, I'm gonna put the link to the bill in the chat. Um, let's see, hold on. So, um, this is one bill that we have been interested in. Um, as you know, Senator Gonzalez, well, hopefully, you know, Senator Gonzalez has been a champion for um, immigrant immigrant justice um, over the years. And we believe this bill does help to protect um, tenants um, who are in living situations that are substandard. So um, uh, this is gonna go to the local government and housing committee and as I know right now, it was introduced on the 24th. Um, and I don't believe we, I have when it will be in committee. So I, I don't have information about that yet. Um, so this is a, a good piece of legislation to keep an eye out for. Um, and we wanted to kind of share it with you all. Um, and I don't have any information about whether or not testimony is needed, but I would say that anybody who has had an experience with a, a landlord um, where their the habitability, the livability of their um, rented home was in question, um, that they should reach out and get in touch with um, Senator Gonzalez or myself, and I can put you in touch with her too. Um, because I imagine that testimony would be very helpful to getting this bill passed. I think it will offer some good protections. Um, and let's see, I believe there is one other bill. Let's see. Hold on. For mobile homes. This one's called Mobile Home, Mobile Home Park Act Updates. And this one is put forward by Representative Hooten, um, Edie Hooten, and uh, Representative Julie McCluskey with Senator Fenberg and Senator Lee on the Senate side. Oh, wait. Oh, hold on. This one's a little bit old. I'm sorry. Um... Here it is. Um, okay, 
So this bill is it's um called uh, it's uh, let's put this one in the chat too. This one's a little bit different than um so I'm sorry, the sponsors for this bill are the primary sponsor is Senator Cleve Simpson. Wait, is this right? I'm sorry, hold on just a second. Mm, this one is the sale of a mobile home. Okay, hold on just a second, y'all. I've got the wrong ones pulled up. Um. Oh. Okay. This is okay. There's the clean water bill. I think that um they were this bill is actually not entirely uh yeah. drafted yet, and it's still in draft form. But I spoke with Charles uh, Charlie Brennan from the Colorado um, Policy, from a Colorado Organization for Law and Policy. And the Mobile Home Act is actually not yet introduced. So it's not on their website yet, which is why I'm having trouble finding it. Okay, so the Mobile Home Act um, is a piece of legislation that is being drafted right now. Um, it's in formation and it would protect mobile home communities from um, kind of being taken advantage of by the owners of the properties. Uh, so many people might know that when you own a mobile home, oftentimes you will own the home itself and then you rent the piece of land that the home is on. <laughs> I'm seeing some nods, that's good. Um, so, and then they rent the piece of land that the home is on. Um, mobile home is a little bit of a, not a misnomer, but misleading in some ways, because many of these homes cannot actually be picked up and moved to another location um, should the, the land that you're renting um, be in question. So um, this bill would, would help to protect um, people who um, are living in mobile home communities. Um, it is right now in, yeah, in draft form. It has not yet been introduced, but I believe the sponsors are in um, communication with the Colorado Center for Law and Policy. And they said that they are um, not yet ready to accept testimony um, or to like talk to people about testimony, but they um, in the future said that they would like to have um, people who live in mobile home communities and wanna see this kind of bill passed um, to come forward and 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 have their testimony testimony um, worked with by the um, by the sponsors too. So um, that's a little bit about that. As as soon as I get more information about that, everybody who has kind of registered for this call, I'll be able to share some more information with you. Um, so I'm sorry I don't have more information about that one. Those are the bills that I am the most familiar with that are, are um, housing focused. Does anyone else have a bill that they'd like to discuss that's housing focused at the state legislature? All right. Well, thank you all so much. There's a one more, uh, one more thing I kind of want to say, which is, um, uh, the Colorado State Legislature is very um, accessible. So especially if we go as a group. So um, we at AFSC don't have a lobby day on the books right now, um, but there will be times when we'll in invite people to go to go to the state legislature and, and go to a committee to testify on the bills. Um, so keep an eye out for that. But when we go together, um, we can really just start to um, really see how the laws are made, um, how there's real people who are behind putting these laws forward, um, putting these policies forward to be passed by the state legislature. Um, I will say from in my experience, um, the federal government is a difficult place to get um, my values represented. 
and at the state legislature, I'm more often able to see pieces of legislation that really do reflect my values. Um, so I would urge folks to really try to get involved at the state legislature. Um, we can we can go there together. We can support each other. Uh, I like to think of it as um, it is actually our house, and we want to make sure that we take good care of it by showing up and doing what we can to stand for justice. So um, I want to say that, and I want to say also that um, it is um, uh, a place that we we want to bring. Uh, everybody. So we want um, monolingual Spanish speakers to be there. We want homeless people to be there. We want people who are struggling um, be, with employment to be there. We want everyone who um, has a has a vested interest in seeing the state of Colorado be a better place to feel um, that that place is that place where those laws are made are accessible to them. And if there's something that is um, a barrier, we want to address it together. So whether it's a language barrier, um, whether it feels intimidating, um, whether you just feel like you just need a buddy to get to the state capitol, we want to be um, doing that work together. So um, that's what I want to say about that. Um, and if no one has any other questions, um, if, if folks have any other questions, I'd urge you to come off mute now. Um, otherwise, I think if you all want to turn your cameras on and say good night, uh, and thank you for being here to each other, uh, that'd be great. We'll say thanks for being here. Thanks for participating and... <laughs> Um, you can come off mute and say goodnight if you'd like. Good night. Yeah. Good night. Oh, good night. Buenas noches. Buenas noches. Buenas noches. Buenas noches. <laughs> and thank you so much, Alejandro, for being our interpreter for tonight. I know we covered a lot of detail. <laughs> okay. Have a great day. Good night.